Okay, welcome everybody. Thank you for making it. Our, our first student scholar speaker is Will Contreras. He's going to talk to us about settler colonialism, race, and the logic of elimination. It's already gone that far over my head, I have to say, but I am definitely looking forward to learning something new today. I hope you do too. So without further ado, over to Will. So settler colonialism, race, and the logic of elimination. Next slide. So first and foremost, what is settler colonialism? In its simple sense, it's people migrating from one country and then settling in another. But in many other ways, it's so much more of this. It entails the reproduction of an external society elsewhere, imposing it on an indigenous community. Examples of this that you might be aware of are American settlement, New Zealand, Australia, South Africa. It's really common. And fundamentally, this is driven by the appropriation of territory, the acquirement of territory, so that it can then be exploited by settlers. And then it's also driven by the removal of criminals, of poverty, in the case of British settlement, so that they can be removed from that society and thus can be economically productive elsewhere. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in many ways, it's very important because of its interaction with indigenous people, which is fundamentally a destructive relationship. And it does this in many ways. First and foremost, it erases the indigenous people so that it can justify settlement. And then it erodes their culture so that they then can be assimilated into the main introduced economy. And then the third way, this indigenous society is then romanticized and appropriated by settlers. And then this fourth point, very important, it's important to understand this not as a historical event, but something which perpetuates it continually and re retroactively justifies itself. So it's a very dynamic process. Next slide, please. So cultural erasure. So one per way this does this is through terminology. So this term here, the age of discovery. So one thing that's important to understand is that this was justified through quote unquote discovery of new, for example, the new world in America. But in many senses, this is new. It's been occupied for thousands of years. And therefore this is the basis of the legal doctrine of discovery so that they have the right to settle. And terra nullius, this is the more overt manifestation of this. So that, so in the case of Australia, it was declared terra nullius, meaning that it was no plan, thus it could be justified for a settlement. And only in 2013 did the Australian government recognise that there was indigenous people in Australia before settlement. So this, you can see this is a really continual process propagating itself into the future to erase the destruction of indigenous people. And this is fundamentally expansionist. And this painting here, very famous, the Oxbow, and you can see there's a barren frontier and settlement is seen as providential, imposing agrarianism, as liberating on a unoccupied frontier. And that's fundamentally the myth of this, that no one lived there, but obviously that's not the case. So next slide, please. Then societal erosion. So in many ways, settlers coerced indigenous people. So one example is the Treaty of Watangi, signed in 1840 between Northern Maori tribes and settlers. But in many ways, this manipulated differences in culture. Maori language at the time did not have a concept of sovereignty. And this, this document, ceded sovereignty to British, but it was fundamentally on the misunderstanding of the implications of this. So Britain manipulated this to gain territory. So this incongruous concept of the Eurocentric concept of land ownership really doesn't apply to these indigenous societies, which are more communal and collective. So thereby, by applying this external land ownership laws, they, they could seize land. And then this, these forces of Westernism really led to 
internal shifts. Very notable examples is within the Cherokees in uh, Georgia. So their native religion really was eroded by missionaries, ardent from Spanish, French, and then obviously British. And then one thing's notable, it had prior to settlement, it was a it was an equal society through genders, but after that, British um, settlers only interacted with male in, uh, Cherokees, and thereby we can see within the hundred years of settlement that um, when the Cherokee constitution was drafted, this was only done by men. So these led to really severe changes in these internal societies. Um, and then the, the most over is physical removal. So in many ways, it was destructive. First and foremost was disease. The spread of so-called virgin soil diseases in indigenous communities, but by no means was this inevitable. Um, squalid conditions imposed on indigenous people as their lands were dispossessed meant they, disease was more rife. And also this was driven by frontier rape and venereal disease. So by no means can you absolve blame on settlers. They were very much active in this process. And then land dispossession through treaties, through land purchases, which were fundamentally coercive, working off the concept of land ownership and the implications of what this meant. And then war. So, for example, in America, the amount of wars through the 1700s to 1900s between Native Americans and settlers is quite ridiculous. The War of 1812, Seven Years' War, the American Revolutionary War, Seminole Wars, Spanish American, they're, they're all set. American, Native Americans are fundamentally always losing here, always alienated in the and then clearly genocide in Australia is a very clear example in Tasmania. Um, settlers introduced martial law, basically allowing the murder of Aboriginal people. And eventually in 1823, the so-called Black Line sweeps through Tasmania, running a whole of the reigning of Aboriginal people, interning them where within a few years, all but 47 had died. So this is really complete genocide there. And then expulsion, as I mentioned, the Cherokees, very famously, the Trail of Tears after the 1813 Indian Removal Act, they're forcefully expelled into the frontier from their original territories, their ancestral territories, and this really damages their society as they have a really holistic connection with their land with that environment and next slide. And assimilation. So through from the 1850s to 1900s, boarding schools were introduced in Australia and uh, America, whereby native children were taken to these boarding schools so that they could be taught as basically through propaganda into Westernism and kidnapping in Australia, Aboriginal children were kidnapped and then adopted into white families so that they would lose their Aboriginal identity so they could be integrated. Well, that's perhaps not the right word. This is known as the lost generation, the stolen generation. It's really overt policies of trying to destroy these communities. And then they're defined by quote unquote blood quantum laws, which define um, by their, their nativeness in a way that they could be destroyed, assimilated, and that they could be homogenized into these centers. Um, and then it's also very important to understand this as not a static process, but one that goes forward. So through the appropriation, through the ownership of native terminology, they, they really disowned this. So obviously, the Kansas Chiefs, you see a spearhead there, and then the Washington Redskins, which obviously has been changed recently, but these really show how this is not a, a static, something of the past, but something really continues forward, the disownership of native communities. 
on the surface. Then historical ratio. This is a picture from Australia Day commemorating the first landings in Australia in 1788. Now, from an Aboriginal perspective, this would be seen as the invasion of Australia. So its celebration really erases the genocide, destruction of these Aboriginal societies, and therefore it seems completely inappropriate to be celebrated in this way. So cultural erasure, destroying their history, seen a way to justify retroactively what occurred there, and this really appears to the modern day. So uh, that's all. Thank you. Any questions? I have two questions. One of them I think is easy, one of them might be more difficult. The, the first question I had for you is, why does this particular subject area interest you? And the second question I had is, is there anything positive about settler colonialism at all? You paint quite a negative view, and understandably so, but is there anything, has this ever been done in a positive way, or are there any positive aspects of it? So those are my two questions for you. Why this topic? Is there anything positive? To uh, well, I mean, it's very much a, a live issue, imperialism, and it links into British Empire, which is studying at A-level, but this is a sort of offshoot of that, something that, I mean, perhaps has been forgotten somewhat in uh, many aspects uh, in America, Australia, New Zealand, whatnot, and it hasn't been recognised as much as it could be. And then, it, it, is it a positive? I think very rarely could you see that as a, from an Indigenous perspective, sort of, never seen as a, as a positive there. So some examples are far more severe, for example, in Australia. In New Zealand, it's more uh, built on coerciveness rather than it's over murder. But it's it's never a positive relationship. Okay, That's never. Exactly. There's no, nothing for Well, I, I, I think fundamentally it would be defined as something else. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Thank you. Questions? How do you think it's evolved in the years? Um, well, so initially it would start with the cultural erasure in the sense that they, they pretend that yes, no one's there so that they can come back. And then it evolves into the destruction of those populations. But the assimilation is sort of the, the last stage which occurred up until after the Second World War, quite recently, actually, in some of these policies. So the, the, the destruction of their history and managing how people view these things can, is probably the, the latest stage of this development, I guess. You must have some questions for me. Um, well, I mean, it, it is obviously very difficult because it's so ingrained in some of these cultures. For example, the reservation systems in America where it's sort of, there's systemic poverty there because of the environment that the main income is ironically tourism. So it is it's very difficult. I, I think one of the key things is to, to recognize what happened. And that would be the, I, I don't think you can move on without recognizing the history of what occurs first and foremost. questions okay well will I, I i certainly learned a lot from this i i was really i was really struck by i suppose what i might call the the sort of power of cultural value systems being able to impose one cultural value system onto another the examples you gave for example of the gender equality amongst the cherokees um and how when the you know the colonialists came in they only spoke to the men i thought that was that was really interesting how all land ownership issues you talked about in um 
in New Zealand, you talked about, you know, this whole business, well, this, this is, we have people at the top and people own land and that's how society works. Yet the value system of the Maori was completely different from that and not something they could associate with. So that really, really struck me. Um, so I certainly, I have to say, it gave me plenty of food for thought. I also made me start thinking, of course, about Romans and Greeks colonizing people. It didn't seem to get any mention, you know, given we're in a Roman colony here in Britain. But anyway, um, I thought it was a really, really good talk. And I'd like to thank you especially for being brave enough to be the first. So a round of applause, fantastic, thank you. Okay, right. So I should, I hope, have an email from Alicia. Uh, Oh, I've got to do something fancy with this. Now, Alicia, I've been preparing for this talk. I read Mexican Gothic over the holidays. Yeah, so I've, that, that's got me back in the mood because I do love a bit of gothic, I have to say. Hope that'll get mentioned. Right, I've got your presentation. I need to do, yes, present mode. And then I need to get back into, oh, where's my Zoom gone? Here we go, back to Zoom. Hmm, why is it not coming up? Aha, excellent. Okay, so Alicia, you're going to talk to us about the gruesome origins of oh, classic fairy yeah. tales. I'm so looking forward to this. Right, off you go. Um, so the gruesome origins of our classic fairy tales. So we all know the stories that we were taught when we were younger, such as Little Red Riding Hood or Hansel and Gretel. And then there are those that are most famously now adapted by Disney, for example, The Little Mermaid or Cinderella. And we were taught these when we were young because they had hidden moral messages and they were satisfying to read because in the end, they all lived happily ever after. As children, this can be misleading as we grow up to believe everything has a perfect end. Where in fact, these stories most certainly did not have that perfect ending, and they were originally a lot more disturbing and gruesome to what we know them as now. So, the majority of these stories originated from European folklore before they were adapted by Jacob Ludwig Carlgren, born in 1785, and Wilhelm Carlgren, born in 1786, most famously known as the Brothers Grimm. And they were German folklorists and linguists. And all these stories date back many years and have been passed down through different cultures which have generated different versions throughout history before they were formally adapted and published in 1812 in their book Children and Household Tales. And their initial intentions weren't for these stories to be read by children despite naming the book Children, Household and Tales, but for them to preserve their own culture and Germanic origins. Eventually, when they later discovered children reading them, they adapted them further so that they were more suitable. And they were inspired by the Italian poet Gian Battista Fassil, born in 1566, who also wrote fairy tales with disturbing twists, and the French author Charles Perrault, born in 1628, who laid the foundations to create the new genre of the fairy tale. So starting with Cinderella, and this is probably the most famous fairy tale there is, and it first came about in Greece in the 6th century BCE, where Rhodopis, who was a Greek slave, had her shoes stolen by an eagle, this eagle then later dropped the shoes to the Egyptian king who sought out Rhodopis to marry her, starting the original plot of Cinderella. And another early version was in China between 618 and 907 AD. And this was the first disturbing turn of the story. So the main character, Yixian, was able to make a wish on magical fish bones, and she wishes for a gown in hopes of finding her husband. And at a royal ball, she loses a shoe, which sparks the interest of the prince who seeks to marry her. But during all of this, Yixian's stepmother and stepmother's stepsister murder all of Yixian's friends out of jealousy, and as their punishment in the end, they get crushed to death by a shower of stones. So the basis of this plot is seen throughout the early versions, and in the brothers' room version, in order to try and get the shoe to fit, the stepsisters cut off their toes and carve their feet to mold, to mold into the shape of the shoe. And in the end, their eyes get plucked out by gels at the wedding. 
The Little Mermaid. Now, The Little Mermaid wasn't written by the Brothers Grimm, but it was written in 1837 by the Danish author Hans Christian Andersen, who also famously wrote Frozen, Thumbelina, and Ugly Duckling. And it starts off in a similar way to the version we know now, where The Little Mermaid has a fascination with humans. However, he wrote that every time she tried to reach the surface of the water, she would get dragged down and tortured by millions of sea creatures. But it gets even worse. Once she spots a prince in a shipwreck, she makes a deal with a sea witch in that she will grow a pair of legs in exchange for her voice. But he wrote that her tongue was also cut off, and every time she used her legs, she would step on a thousand shards of glass, leaving her in immense constant pain. And the curse also said that if she cannot win the heart of the prince and marry him, she will die and dissolve into sea foam. And following the unsettling nature of the story, the prince marries another woman and she dies alone. Rapunzel. Now, Rapunzel was also written by the Brothers Grimm, and it is still a fairly dark fairy tale that involves um, some a bit of Stockholm Syndrome. And the first telling was in 1697 in France, where a young prince climbs a tower to find a young girl named Hazel Neck who was stolen at birth. And once he speaks to her, he tricks her into entering the tower, where he then rapes her. Hazel Neck finds out she's pregnant, and the prince agrees to marry to help her raise the baby. But once the stepmother finds out, she throws the prince out of the tower, blinding him, and leaves Parsonette stuck in the tower to raise the baby on her own. Now, Rapunzel was said to have been based on the life of St. Barbara, who was a young Italian woman who lived in the third century. And she was said to have been so beautiful that her father had to lock her in a tower so that no man could get to her. And during her time in the tower, she became a faithful Christian and dedicated herself to God, resulting in her rejecting all marriage proposals. But her father was a pagan, so she ended up trying to escape. But as she did, her father grabbed his sword and then beheaded her, which is seen in the image here. And in the end, he gets struck by lightning, and it was said to have been a punishment like from God, like beheading her. Next slide, please. Um, Sleeping Beauty. Now, Sleeping Beauty is definitely one of the most disturbing stories there is, and it was written by the Italian poet Gian Battista Basso in 1634. And it was called The Sun, the Moon, and Talia. Now, once Talia pricked her finger on his spindle, she fell into a deep sleep, as we all know. But a king comes across Talia and tries to wake her. When he, he thinks that she cannot be waked, he then repeatedly rapes her. And she doesn't wake for a while, but how she wakes is by giving birth to some twins. But the, and then once she wakes, she agrees to marry this king. But the king already had a wife, and once she found out about Talia and the children, she murdered the children, cut them, and fed them to the king. And, no, and then she proceeded to try and throw Talia into a fire, but the king came in time and murdered her. But Basile wrote that there was a happy ending, but it is a questionable happy ending following the horrifying bits of the story. Next slide, please. Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Now, in the Brothers Grimm version, Snow White is a seven-year-old girl, and the queen is set out on killing her, so she sends the huntsman out, huntsman out to kill her, and as proof, he would bring back her liver and her lungs so she could eat them. Luckily, he brings back a boar instead, but the queen tries to kill Snow White another three times, eventually poisoning her with an apple. And in this version, there isn't a classic romantic true love's kiss, but the prince comes across Snow White in the glass coffin and realises she is so beautiful that he wants to take away her coffin so that he could admire her beauty forever. The dwarves reluctantly agree and move the coffin, but as they do, the coffin smashes and wakes up Snow White because the apple dissolves from her throat somehow. And she wakes up and agrees to marry the prince, following the pattern of she wakes up and marries the prince immediately, even though she's only a seven-year-old girl. And at their wedding, they give a punishment to the queen that she is danced to her death whilst wearing burning hot iron shoes. Beauty and the Beast. Now, the Beauty and the Beast is a well-loved fairy tale, but some believe it to be Stockholm Syndrome, so it is a bit controversial. But the idea of the beast came from a man named Petrus von Salvas, who was alive during the 15th century. And he had a genetic condi condition called hypertrichosis, where he had an abnormal amount of excess hair growth. And throughout his whole life, he was treated like a wild animal, until eventually the King of France allowed him into his court, where he then met his wife and started to be treated like a normal human being. So the story, the story came about um, a couple of centuries later, in the 17th century, written by Gabrielle Suzanne de Villeneuve, and her story was said to have been inspired by the ancient Roman tale of Cupid in Psyche, and there's a statue of, her, of them in the Louvre. And in this tale, Psyche was banished by the goddess Venus because she was jealous of her beauty, and she was said to wed 
and murderous speeds, and she would get her son Cupid to make them fall in love. But Cupid falls in love with Psyche instead and takes her away to his own palace and visits her in the dark every night and instructs her to never look at his face. But one night, Psyche disobeys him and shines a candlestick, so Cupid ends up running away. And Psyche is set out and looking for Cupid. As she does, Venus sets a series of cruel tasks for Psyche to complete. In the end, she completes them and wants Cupid begs Venus to stop, and they, they become immortal and marry in heaven creating ancient Roman love story. Little Red Riding Hood. Now, Little Red Riding Hood is well known for having a dark background, as there have been numerous unpleasant retellings of the story, and it first came about in 10th century France, where the wolf wasn't over instead. And once the young girl arrived at her grandmother's cottage, the wolf deceived her into mistaking her grandmother's teeth was rice, her flesh was steak, and her blood was wine. So the young girl unknowingly eats and drinks her own dead grandmother before the wolf then eats her himself. And similar versions were found in China, Greece, and Italy at the same time. And in a slightly more modern version, written by French author Charles Perrault, the story of the grandmother eating her own, the story of Red Riding Hood eating her own grandmother is kept, but Afterwards, he instructs, no, he instructs Red Riding Hood to take her clothes off where he then rapes her before murdering her himself. Hansel and Gretel. Now this story came about during the Great Famine in Europe between 1314 and 1322, where there are numerous cases of cannibalism. And some mothers even said to have been eating their own children. And some people were so desperate that they dug up graves and ate the rotting flesh of the dead corpses. And it all starts from the remaining tale, the little boy and his stepmother. And this starts off in a similar way to Hansel and Gretel, where two abandoned children follow their way home, but they follow a trail of ashes. And as soon as they return home, the stepmother immediately kills the young boy and forces the younger sister to prepare his meal, to prepare his corpse for a family meal. So the sister reluctantly agrees, and as she does, she hides the boy's heart in a specific tree and then serves up the family meal, where the father unknowingly eats his own son. And afterwards, she takes the boy's bones into the same tree where she stores the heart. And the next morning, a cookie bird emerges from that tree and shouts, cookie. My sister has cooked me, my father is eating me, but now I'm a cuckoo and safe from my stepmother. The terrified stepmother then throws a large rock at the cuckoo, but this falls back immediately, hitting her head and killing her instantly. Yeah. And finally, Pinocchio. Now this was written by the Italian author Carlo Bologna in 1881. And it was written as a serial in a newspaper. By then, the Brothers Grimm had already published around 200 stories. So he was said to have been influenced by their writing. And in the well loved Disney version, Gebetto is a toy maker who creates a wooden puppet boy named Pinocchio. And he's always wanted a son. So one night he wishes upon a star and Pinocchio comes to life, along with a cricket who is Pinocchio's conscience. But in Colodi's version, Pinocchio, as soon as Pinocchio comes to life, he kills the cricket instantly with a mallet. And then manipulates the townsfolk into believing Gebetto has abused him, so Gebetto ends up in jail. He continues to spread chaos throughout the town, and the townsfolk burn his feet off. And in the end, he gets hung in the middle of the town square. So knowing the dark and twisted origins of the story definitely changes the way you view them, and thankfully they have been adapted for children. But it's interesting to see how they pass down through history, generated different versions, and they have been seen all over the world. But it does raise the question, should we be taught these as children, knowing that they are so originally disturbing? However, it, they have been a significant part of childhood for many years, and they still are, but it's a good reminder that there is always more to the story, and it's never just a simple happily ever after. <laughs> Yeah, there's lots of, lots of people eating each other. Lots of, sort of themes of cannibalism here. Um, I mean, it got me sort of thinking, what are the particular themes, shall we say, of these fairy tales that, I know it sounds obvious, that make them unsuitable for children, but I'm thinking, what particular themes come through in all of them, do you um, think? A lot of them, well, murder is one of them, like um, rape um, and cannibalism, I'd say the most three. But I think if you, as children, those are things that you don't really know yet, haven't been introduced to, so it can be quite a shock if you learn about them through fairy tale. Presumably the people that wrote them, you know, Mr. The Brothers Grimm in, in Grimm it was, in 1812, 
Um, they were writing them for who? For children? Well, originally they wanted to write them just to kind of preserve their own cultures, and the majority of them came from like, European folklore. But as children did start to read them, um, so obviously being introduced to all these topics um, that were harrowing for them. But eventually, I think they were later adapted further, so it was okay. Right. And obviously now, you know, different versions. So maybe a different cultural views yeah. on what's acceptable, appropriate for children has kind of changed. Interesting. Any questions, guys? Yeah. I was just wondering, who, who do you think the original audience was meant to be? I mean, it was meant to be for adults, but what was, what was their purpose? Um, I think the purpose was, I think, because the Brothers Grimm wanted to pursue a career in law, but they took interest in literary research and they wanted to preserve their Germanic origins and then eventually found these other stories that came from different cultures and different countries. And they just wanted to keep it as a reminder of their own culture because at, at that time, I think it was starting to disappear. So they just wanted to have like a written copy of their own culture. It was quite a bit nice. So, so, so in music, for example, Vaughan Williams collected lots of folk songs. And wanted to preserve those. There's nothing really unpleasant about the mm. about the music. But they wanted to, to collect these really quite unpleasant. So, so winding it back one stage. Yeah. So, the, so the original stories. What what do you think the, the function of them was? I think they were the just um made as a like a time passing thing. I know it. Many of them came from. I think some of them came from like housewives just trying to pass the time and just you know keep Almost them interested. Like, Shop yeah. That, that's so, then my, my last question is to do with so then they've now been turned into quite sort of saccharine, Disney fied, so yeah. as you sort of made points of Marathi tales. I'm just, just curious as to what, why, why do they say they morph on these really sort of grim shop fiction? Mm, I'm not entirely sure how they've gone, gone from, from like two different ends, but I think because some of them do contain like moral stories that I'm assuming Walt Disney took interest in mm. and then decided to develop them. But I don't know the background that you Yeah, that. I do not do you, do you think they should be cancelled? Do you think that most of the Disney outfits should not be cancelled? Um, I don't it's think background. they should be. I think they've become so like engraved in our life and childhood, it's going to be very hard to do that. But I just think it's nice to be aware that it isn't all perfect and like all the princesses and everything. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, back. Um, do you think like the defense defense rendering of the fairy tales for children has promoted like the gender binary and reinforced stereotypes rather than more and more flexible and arguably? Um, yeah, I think it has definitely done that. Um, because I think in the Disney versions there are very extreme gender stereotypes, and maybe in these versions there wasn't. Um, but I think they they could have done it in a different way. I think was creating them to be more modern. I think they could have changed the way they did it. But... Somebody else had a question. Wolfie, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's an awesome. <laughs> oh, okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, I, I thought it was an absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I will never look at some of these fairy tales in the same way again, uh, especially this idea that, um, yeah, that Little Red Riding Hood mistook yeah. her grandmother for a meal. What was it? Her blood was wine. Yeah. Oh, yeah, her skin was still on steak. Yeah, that, that was just, you know, yeah, that, that's definitely going to stick in my mind. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> and thank you so much for, again, agreeing to do this in the first week. It's really great. Thank you very much. Round of applause.